Now we're going to read 2 Kings 22, verses 1 and 2, or the same verses are actually in 2 Chronicles 34, 1 and 2. And by the way, 2 Kings 22 and 23 and 2 Chronicles 34 and 35 are parallel scriptures. They tell basically the same story. The reason it's worth reading both of them is that Chronicles tends to be more from the Lord's point of view and Kings tends to be more from a human point of view. So you'll see insights in each uh, book that are a little different than the other ones. It's really awesome when God puts the same story in different books because you get real insight into those stories. So we're going to read, as we go through this, if we do go through it, we're going to read from both sections because they each have different insights, all right? But th today they're just the same. Josiah was eight years old when he became king, and he reigned 31 years in Jerusalem. His mother's name was Jedidiah, the daughter of Adiah of Bozkath. He did right in God's sight, and he walked in, everyone say all, all the ways of his father David. By the way, David was not his physical father. You just need to see how the scripture's recording this. It's very interesting. He walked in all the ways of his father David. He did not turn aside to the right or to the left. <clears throat> okay, I have seven points, but I'm hopefully just going to make one today. World changers make the journey from victim to victory. World changers make the journey. And by the way, it is a journey because this takes a little bit of time. Some of you, I know you had an encounter 27 years ago and you've been victorious ever since. But most of us, that's not our experience. Honestly, we're, most of us have had to fight for this victory. It's not that Jesus didn't purchase it because he did. It's that we've had to fight for its reality, to believe it fully, to embrace it, to learn the promises, to walk in the promises, to overcome bad habits, etc., etc., etc. We have to make the journey from victim to victory. And I want to tell you that you may not believe this, but I would say 100% of us are victims in some way or another. And what I mean by that is 100% of us blame somebody else or something else for our issues. That makes us a victim. Because whenever you blame someone or somebody else, you can't be responsible. If it's my wife's fault, then I'm off the hook. If it's my pastor's fault, I'm off the hook. If it's my employer's fault, I'm off the hook. You see, blaming makes you a powerless victim. Blaming makes you responsible for nothing and everyone else responsible for everything. And if you don't learn how to move from victim to victor, you will never change the world. But if you learn how to go from victim to victory, you will change the world. However, it is the first step. It's the very beginning of becoming a world changer, moving from victim to victory. This isn't just a cute saying. It's absolutely essential for us to change the world. It is step one. I understand that not everything in life is equal. When I'm saying this, I'm not saying it with a snotty tone of voice. I'm not saying it with sarcasm. I'm saying I know that many of us have had really difficult circumstances, really raunchy situations that we didn't deserve. I mean, there are people in this room that have just been absolutely traumatized, mistreated, victimized. So I'm not mocking you if you've been a victim of something. That's not what I'm saying. Please hear me. I'm saying that in spite of the fact that we've had bad things happen to us, we have to move in our minds and hearts from being a victim in our identity to becoming a victor in our identity. We must move from our current reality, if it's victim, to victor and stay there. We can't go back and revisit it because it's more comfortable or we're more used to it. We must abandon the victim mentality and the victim mindset and the victim identity. And by the way, every time we sin, by being a victim is a sin, every time we sin, we get some benefit from it or we wouldn't do it. And being a victim has a ton of benefits. You get, you get more sympathy when you're a victim. People treat you with velvet gloves when you're a victim because you're touchy. You can blame other people when you're a victim. There's lots of things that you get from being a victim 
that subconsciously are benefits, and so we like being victims. We may not say, we, may, we would never say we like it, but we like it because we're benefiting from it. And so I want to say this, whenever you make a change in your life, you not only have to change, but you have to renounce the way it was in order to go where it's meant to be. Renouncing means this. It doesn't just mean repenting. Repenting is turning from this to that. Renouncing is saying, Lord, I wish I never would have benefited from that. And for most people, that's very difficult. You were in an illicit, adulterous relationship. Yes, you repented, meaning you're not doing it anymore, but you still savor it. You never renounced it. Therefore, it's still lodged in your heart. Renouncing means you come to the place where you actually say, I wish that would have never, I mean that with all my heart, I wish that would have never happened. Regardless of the pleasure, regardless of the seeming benefit, I wish I never would have looked at that pornography. I wish I would have never done that thing. I wish I would have never stolen that thing. I wish I never would have cheated my boss. I wish that thing would have never happened and I would have never done that evil. That's renouncing. That's different than repentance. Repentance is you're going this way and you choose to go this way. Renouncing is letting go of it in your heart and the benefit of it. It's repenting of the benefit of it. Does that make sense? We're, we're getting super practical here. I hope you're hearing me. This is very, very important because what we're talking about right now is the emotional seedbed to be a world changer. It's the mental, emotional, spiritual seedbed. If you want to be a world changer, things have to shift in your heart and mind and emotions. Absolutely. Having said that, some of us have been discriminated against because of race or gender. Maybe you've come from a very challenging, dysfunctional family, experienced abuse, been mistreated. Maybe you've had a disability or pain that's been uh, debilitating. Setbacks that weren't your fault. Other people cheated you, rejected you, abandoned you. Maybe you've been betrayed. And I just want to say that God understands. And he's not making fun of you or putting you down or saying, no big deal. He cares about your pain. The Bible says in Isaiah, in all our affliction, he was afflicted. There's no pain that we experience that God doesn't also experience that pain. Compassion means to feel with. Psalm 145 says you are compassionate, gracious, gracious, merciful, and compassionate. God feels what we feel. And there's nothing about our pain that is glib to God or no big deal to God. He feels deeply what we feel, and it matters to him. I know sometimes in the Christian world, we get around certain Christians, and they act like our pain doesn't matter. They're like glib. They just throw out promises all the time, and it's as though they don't care about us. They just want to spout Bible verses at us, but that's not the Lord. Yes, of course, he wants us to understand his word, but the first thing he does is he actually understands us because he knows the answers. Believe me, God knows the answers, but he wants you to know that your heart is safe with him, and you can trust him with your pain. You can trust him with the victimization that you have experienced. You can't move on from it unless you understand that God cares about it because you'll always be looking for affirmation in your victimization until you finally accept the reality that God deeply cares about the fact that you've been victimized. He's not glib about your pain. Each of us has a different story and each story matters. And they're all a big deal. I don't, and you know, it's important that we don't compare because the reality is, is that growing up, some of us had very thick skin and some of us had very thin skin. So what one person experienced at home may have seemed very light compared to somebody else, but that sensitive soul, it wreaked havoc, the little bit of trauma they experienced, where somebody else had very thick skin, they experienced a lot of trauma and it just was water off a duck's back. So that's why we mustn't compare. We don't. We haven't been in each other's shoes, and we don't know what it was like for one another. Does that make sense? That's why it's important that we don't judge. We just help each other onto the next phase of life. So let me just share a few things about this world changer named Josiah, because I want you to know that he can understand some of the things that we've been through. Number one, he was born in 648 B.C. He died in 609 B.C., which means he lived a relatively short life of 39 years. He never got to be an old man who saw his grandchildren grow up. Even though he did what was right and was a good man, all his days, the Bible says, he never turned to the right or to the left. That means he was totally obedient to the Lord. He was an amazing king who pleased God. 
His life was cut short because he possibly made one bad decision to take on the king of Egypt. The king of Egypt was marching through his land to take on the Assyrian or, or Babylonians or Assyrians, I forget. And uh, Jos King Josiah took offense that the king of Egypt was going through his land and he went to meet him in the battlefield. The king of Egypt sent him a message and said, hey, this isn't personal. I just need to cut through your property here because I'm on my way to a, a war. Please don't mess with me or I'm going to have to kill you. It's basically what the king of Egypt said. And unfortunately, King Josiah took him on, and he got fatally wounded. They had to take him back to the camp, and then he died. And that's how he died. And Jeremiah, who was a prophet during King Josiah's time, lamented the decision that King Josiah made. In fact, part of Lamentations, I think it's three or four, is about the lamentation that Je Jeremiah the prophet had for King Josiah. So this was a painful thing for the prophet of the land, saying, I wish you wouldn't have done that. King Josiah. So it's possible he made one bad decision. One. Which cost him his life. Josiah's grandfather's name was Manasseh. So how many of you, you know, the love of a grandpa is pretty amazing. I are one, so I know. Manasseh was a very evil, idolatrous man. He became king when he was 12 he ruled for 55 years. He died when he was 77 or 67. He was the son of Hezekiah, who was a good king and mostly walked with the Lord. But after Hezekiah died, Manasseh undermined his dad and reversed all of his dad's work. He completely undermined his dad, did, undermined all of his dad's work, and that was Josiah's gramps. His dad's name was Ammon. Ammon was also an evil man. He continued in the idolatrous practices of his dad, Manasseh. He was so hostile against God that he burned the Torah. So this is, this is a king of Judah. He, basically, it would be like if I stood before you and burned the Bible. You, I mean, you guys, that, and I ruled with an iron fist so you couldn't leave. Whereas here, if I burned the Bible, you guys would all walk out. But then you couldn't. He could kill you. So you were stuck. He was the king. He had all the authority. You had none. And he burned the Bible. In fact, it says, it, history says that uh, the, altar in the, or the altar had cobwebs on it because it was so unused. He never used the altar. He burned the Torah. He became king when he was 22 years old. This is Josiah's dad. He became king when he was 22 years old. Josiah was six at the time. So he's a little six-year-old boy. His dad's 22, he becomes king, he's evil, he's idolatrous, he's following in the ways of Manasseh. He's, he's king for two years and his servants are so disgusted with the way he rules, they murder him. So Josiah's eight years old and his dad gets murdered. He becomes king, now think about this. The guys who murdered his dad are in his kingdom, working in his, castle, working in his house, if you will. Ever felt unsafe? He missed out on his childhood. His dad was murdered. He didn't have time to go through grief, grief counseling or trauma counseling because he became king. He got handed a job with terrible modeling and no male role models. He also became king when God's judgment was over the land. It would be like becoming president of the U.S. with enormous national debt, crops aren't growing, there's a food shortage, gas prices are sky high, crime in every inner city. That's what Josiah inherited at eight years old with the guys who murdered his dad watching over him. There's no doubt that Josiah absolutely changed his world. There's no doubt about that. You can read it in Jewish history. You can read it in Christian history. You can read it in the Bible. He turned, he turned an entire nation back to God. He was one of the most godly young kings in all of Israel's history, and he was the last king in what is called the Davidic reign. After him, there were no more in the line of David, if you will. I don't know if you saw the beginning of this text, but it said he followed in the ways of David, his father. So who did he look to as his dad? He looked to King David. He had to ignore his own natural dad and his own grandfather. He had to look all the way back to King David and say, that's my guy. That doesn't mean he didn't honor his father and mother. It means his model was David. And David was an imperfect guy, but David had a, was a man after God's own heart. Are you tracking with me? 
I want you to hear this. There are a lot of reasons why Josiah shouldn't have been able to change the world. That's what I want you to get. There were a lot of reasons why he could have lived his entire life as a victim. He had a dysfunctional family, right? You guys understand he had a dysfunctional family. Everyone say it. How many of you have come from a dysfunctional family? Okay. Josiah's family may have been more dysfunctional than yours. Super evil, murdering, idolatrous people. Sacrilegious, awful. His family of origin was terrible. I wonder how many of us have a father or mother wound. Josiah had a ginormous father wound. His own dad was murdered when he was, 20, when he was eight years old because of how evil he was. I mean, that's a father wound. His grandfather that he should have been able to run to for nurture and care was an idolatrous, evil king that turned people's hearts away from God into idolatry and uh, various kinds of practices that I won't get into right now. And then, how about insecurity? Number one, he's eight years old, so he's feeling, he might be feeling a little bit unprepared for the task. Number two, as I said, he's got, he's got no experience. Number three, he's got these guys watching him that have been through some kingdoms. I mean, they were with Manasseh, by the way. So they were with his grandfather. Then they were with his dad, who only ruled for two years. And now they're, in his, they're his advisors and his, you know, generals. And they're watching him like a hawk. You ever felt unsafe in the workplace? I think he might have you beat what we call unsafe. His was pretty unsafe. So here's a question for you. When do legitimate challenges become excuses? Because these are big deals. These aren't, we don't want to mock these or say they're no big deal. These are big deals that Josiah went through. Maybe they're big deals that you've gone through. We're not making light of these. I mean, many of us have family of origin issues. We have father or mother wounds. We have insecurity, feelings of inadequacy. We have situations that make us feel unsafe. What do we do to not make excuses? How do we move from victim to victor? What do we do? Because these things are real. Number one, we have to recognize and acknowledge issues. Here's the thing, guys. There's always someone who's had it easier than you, than you and there's always somebody who's had it harder than you. Just, just accept that. If you ever get into a pity party, there's somebody that's had it easier than you, so yes, that will justify your pity party, but there's somebody who's had it harder than you, which should pull you out a little bit, just a little bit. I was just reading uh, this morning about uh, when I went to Sierra Leone and I saw the people without hands and without, you know, cut off here and here, and I remembered the blood diamond story that they cut off people's hands and they would say to them, uh, hand or elbow? And the reason they cut off their hands is so they couldn't raise their hand to vote. That's why they, that's why they cut off. I was reading an article about a woman who got her, she was 12 years old, they just, they, they hacked off both her arms at the elbows. Or excuse me, right here. For no other reason than they didn't want her to grow up and vote against them. Maybe she had it tougher than we have. Maybe. It's just good to remember. That's not to minimize our pain. That's just to say, stay in perspective. You've had it rough. Other people have had it less rough than you. Others have had it way rougher than you. All over the world, people are experiencing craziness. Get perspective. Recognize your issues. Acknowledge your issues, but stay humble about your issues. Sometimes people take identity in their issues. It becomes their calling card. I've had people be in the church for 20 years, and they still tell the same stories they told when I first met them about how wounded they are, about how hard life is, about this, about that. And I'm thinking they, their identity is in their pain. They've decided to camp in their pain. I remember um, when I was working at the People's Kitchen back in, I was pastoring the Five Cities Vineyard, and I went, uh, we used to, I used to minister a lot to the homeless, um, even before I was in so-called vocational ministry, just as a teenager I started, 
And uh, <clears throat> I met this one guy, and uh, he, he had this great story. He just said, you know, I've got a disability check, or I forget, I think it was a disability check coming. I don't have an address because I'm homeless, but it comes to my grandma's house. It should be here in about two weeks. I just need some money to get me by for two weeks. And uh, I learned when I was on staff, by the way, to verify people's story. It was very fascinating. It really helped me a lot. But in those days, I didn't know to verify anyone's story. I just took people at face value and did whatever they asked because I thought that was what a Christian did. And I'd understand that you could actually have discernment and you could make wise decisions. But anyway, so, you know, gave this guy money, and, um, which, I, which, which was hard-earned for me, by the way. I was probably poorer than he was. I was, I was working my way through college, I was loaning my mom my car, and I would run or ride my bike to work in San Luis Obispo from Laguna Lake and going to Cal Poly. And, you know, I, I, I barely had enough food to eat, but I was just doing my best because I was trying to be a Christian and trying to love people. And anyway, I met this guy, and I would go to the homeless shelter, the people's kitchen, and I'd see this guy a lot. And, he, and I would overhear him saying the same story to other people. And over time, I realized it's not two weeks. In fact, I don't know if it's even true. Then I went out, of, and he knew me. He knew me by name. I could tell you his name. I'm not going to say his name. And uh, I went away. We planted a church in Ohio for six years, came back, and I went to the people's kitchen. And guess who was there? This guy. He didn't recognize me, came up to me, told me the exact same story. And let me tell you something. He looked very well fed, good color in his cheeks, robust looking like... He'd been really well taken care of. And he had decided that homelessness was his identity because it worked out really well. In fact, I've picked, and again, I'm not picking on homeless people. There are some homeless people that are Vietnam vets that have tremendous problems. So it's not, it, one size doesn't fit all. But I have picked up a number personally and hung out with them and taken them to my house and given them a shower and a meal and said, hey, how would you feel if I got you a job? And I've had several say to me, oh, no, 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 thanks. Yeah, I don't, I don't want a job. This is... I love my life. Again, I'm not saying everybody loves their life, but I've had some say that to me. So I'm just saying that to, and by the way, you don't have to be homeless to take out your identity and your pain or your victimization. It's just, it, it's, a, it's a clear illustration of what it means to live in your, the identity of your pain, the identity of your problem, the identity of your difficulty. Yes, you've had issues. Yes, you have issues. Yes, I have issues. I've had issues. We aren't minimizing. We aren't ignoring. It's been hard. We hear you. 1 Corinthians 10, 13 says, No temptation has overtaken you except what is common to men. What you're going through is common to people. I don't mean that it's not important. It's just there's a lot of people that have gone through what you've gone through and what you're going through. And the Bible says that he will provide a way of escape so that you can bear up under it. It doesn't mean it's going to go away or it's going to get easy, but you can make it. You can do it. You can come through it. So we have to acknowledge our issues. Nobody's trying to minimize anyone else's issues here. Nobody's trying to minimize anyone else's pain, make fun of it, say it's no big deal. We're not going to put a religious, uh, slap a religious, uh, you know, uh, pat answer on top of your pain. We're just going to say that's awful. What the pain you've been through or the pain you're going through is awful. We sympathize. We weep with those who weep. End of story. No but. No, here's a verse to sort of make you stop talking about your pain. No, we care. Having said that, we have to let God's truth blow up our pain, blow up our issues. We have to. There is no way forward without the truth setting us free. We must allow the truth of God's word to come into our issues, to come into our pain. Jesus said, you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. It's a promise, it's a guarantee. Just take the truth of a dysfunctional family. How many of you know that Jesus had a dysfunctional family? You may not know that. His own brothers didn't even believe in him. They made fun of him. He did not have familial support for being the savior. He was made fun of. That would constitute dysfunction, constitute rejection. You're supposed to get supported by your family. So what did Jesus say? He said, who is my father, my sister, my brothers, my mother? Is it not those? So what did Jesus have to do? He elevated the spiritual family and, took, and realized this is probably going to be my main family in life, and it's okay. He elevated spiritual family 
above natural family. That's not to dishonor. He just said, I'm going to get my primary fellowship needs met through my spiritual family. Those who do the will of God, they are my mother, sister, brothers, family. This is who I hang with. This is where I get nurtured and encouraged and strengthened. And some of you need to do that too. It's time to quit talking about how bad your family was and start getting your comfort and nurture from the family of God. Again, your, the, natu- the, spiritual, the church can't replace. It's not the church's job. The church doesn't owe you another childhood. It's not, our, it's not my job to be your dad and re-raise you. Like what you've gone through is terrible, but it's not the church's job to fix all your owies. It's your job to forgive and then learn how to be family. It's not my job to... I I don't have to go to the cross for you because I can't. I'm not the Savior. And no one in here should have to go to the cross for you. Only Jesus can do that. What we can do is love you from this point forward. We can help you get healed of your past hurts. We can help you be sozoed, RTF'd, healing roomed out. We can help you get counseled and freed up and coached and delivered. But you have to let it go. You have to let go of the identity that you're a wounded little puppy and nobody understands you. It's just, it's an old, tired argument, and it's time for it to go. Amen. You know, David said in Psalm 27:10, he said, My father and mother have forsaken me, but the Lord will take me up. So the father wound that David experienced... He experienced rejection. You know, he he experienced rejection from his dad and all of his brothers when they didn't even acknowledge that he was a son. When Samuel came looking, he said, is this all the boys? And finally, Jesse said, "Uh, yeah, I've got a little kid out in the field. I I guess he counts. I mean, that's basically what David went through. David, who fought a lion and a bear, wasn't even acknowledged as a son. I know it's easy to read and gloss over these things, but just think of the human emotion and drama of some of these characters, what they had to go through. That must have been devastating for little David. He said, hey, even though my mom and dad don't get me, you get me. In other words, he put his eyes on the Lord. He didn't just go around and badmouth his parents. In fact, you can't find verses that where he's badmouthing his parents. He just says, even though my mom and dad forsook me, you didn't. That's it. It's it's a prayer. That's it. It's just you get one prayer. You don't get a, a, I need to process how bad my parents were. I mean, I could see processing in the process of inner healing with a trusted counselor who keeps things confidential, but not 20 people. 20 people don't know how, need to know how bad your parents were. It's not right. It's time to let it go. It's time to get healed. It's time to forgive and move on. Otherwise, you're never going to change the world. You're always going to be about you and what you didn't get and who owes you and how you didn't deserve this and how you should have got that and and, and there can be truth in it. It's not that you're crazy. It's just that you're losing your life. You're wasting your days. You're not living the life that you're called to because you're living as a victim. Or insecure, young, and untrained. I mean, for goodness sakes, the guy became king at eight, and what does it say? Paul told Timothy, don't let anyone look down on youthfulness. Instead, be an example in speech, conduct, love, faith, and purity. Be an example, Timothy. I realize you're young and you're feeling insecure. You've got some internal fears. You're a bit of an introvert. I understand all that. But son, be an example. In other words, he didn't say, oh, Timothy, I know you're young. It's okay. Why don't you just hide out in the closet for a few years and just, you know, watch some TV shows. And when you get a little bit older, you know, maybe somebody will mentor you. But if nobody mentors you, you certainly aren't responsible because somebody should have mentored you. And obviously the church didn't do its job again. So poor me. That's how many Christians live, you guys. Blaming, blaming, blaming. Paul told Timothy, hey, you know what? You be the model. You didn't get what you need? You be the model. You know, one time the Lord spoke to me. I I think I've shared this before, but I didn't get all the modeling I needed from my dad, from spiritual dads. And the Lord just said, guess what? You're going to have to be the model. Now, I've done it imperfectly. I I am the first to admit. I have not, because I didn't have on-the-job training because I didn't get it. But the Lord said, you're going to have to dig deep and give what you didn't receive. I'll show you how to do it if you'll do it. And I said, yes. On that day, when he spoke to me, I said, yes, sir, I'll do it. 
And I went from going to meetings to receive to going to meetings to give. I entered relationships to give. I, I think give, not receive. Not that I don't need to receive, not that I don't have needs, but I decided to become a dad in the body of Christ instead of a little boy. So many people, doesn't matter your age, you know, you can be a little boy or a little girl your whole life, always needing, always wanting someone else to change your diaper, always want someone else to take care of you, always want someone else to go get your food for you, always wanting someone else to say, look, I painted the picture, oh, good job, here's a gold star. Hey, you didn't give me a gold star, you're mean. I mean, this is rampant in the body of Christ. And what about just feeling unsafe? I mean, my goodness, he's got counselors that killed his own father. And yet David said, you've prepared a table before me in the presence of my enemies. David learned how to feast in the presence of those who hated him, in the presence of those who wanted to destroy him. Once we learn how to feast in the presence of our enemies, nothing can stop us. But that is going to require us to stop being a victim. You can't be a victim and feast in front of your enemies because you'll always whine about why you even have enemies. Why do I have to have enemies? Well, because you live in the world. Because you're a human being. Get over it. You're going to have enemies. Get over it. Not everyone's going to like you. Not everyone's going to like your personality. Not everyone's going to like what you have to say. Get over it. Do what you got to do. Learn how to feast when people don't like you. I know people that if somebody doesn't like them, they are so nervous and so insecure, it ruins their day, week, month, and year. I'm not saying we should be calloused. I'm saying we've got to get bigger than being a victim. I'm not saying it's cool to have people not like you, but sometimes you can't fix it. And what are you going to do? You've got to live life. Like the command to have joy doesn't stop because somebody doesn't like you. So that means somehow I can have joy even when everything's not perfect, even when people don't like me, even when some people reject me. It's like, yeah, they're lost. Here we go. I believe, and this is going to be hard for some of us who are Christians here. I believe, now I say this in the Lord, I believe that the only way forward from being a victim to a victor is to take 100% responsibility for your life. You cannot blame anyone for anything. Now, I'm not, I'm not saying don't acknowledge bad things have happened to you. Of course they have. I'm not minimizing that. I'm not making fun of that. But I'm saying the only way forward from being a victim to a victor is to take full responsibility for your life. What that means is this. You can't control the events of your life, but you can control your responses to the events of life, which means you can determine the outcome of your life by your responses. You cannot decide how life treats you. You can decide how you respond, which means you're in control of your response. You're in 100% control of your responses. Not a little bit, all of it. You are in charge of your responses 100%. Nobody else can respond for you. Only you can respond. One of the most pervasive myths in American culture is that we are entitled to a great life, that somehow, somewhere, someone, certainly not us, is responsible for filling our lives with continual happiness, exciting career options, nurturing family time, blissful personal relationships, simply because we exist. But the real truth is there is only one person responsible for the quality of life that you desire, and that's you. You're the only person that's responsible for your life. Man, that's a hard pill to swallow. I believe you're hearing the words I'm saying, but I don't know if they're registering. Because they're so revolutionary that most people reject them outright. Most of us have been conditioned to blame something outside of ourselves for the parts of our life we don't like. We blame our parents, our bosses, our friends, our coworkers, our spouse, the weather, the economy, the government, our lack of money. Anything we can pin the blame on when the real problem is There was a man walking at night, and he came across another man on his knees under a street lamp. He said, what are you looking for? He said, oh, I lost my keys. So the guy decided to get down and help him. They were both on their knees looking for these keys for an hour. And after an hour, the passerby 
got a little bit frustrated and he said, look, we've looked everywhere. Are you sure you left your key, lost your keys here? And the guy said, no, no, I lost my keys in the house, but there's just more light out here. <laughs> That's what it's like to blame other people for your life. You're looking for the solution in the wrong place. You can't get the solution by blaming other people. You're under the street lamp when you should be inside your own house. Insanity is what? It's blaming other people, expecting your life to change. Romans 12, 2, I'll just finish with this. Romans 12, 2 in the Living Bible says, be a new and different person in all you do and think. The command to be a new and different person is on you. It's not my job to make you a new and different person. It's not your spouse's job to make you a new and different person. It's not your teacher's. Your, it's on you. If you don't become a new and different person, no one can do it for you. If you do become a new and different person, you can move literally from victim to victor. You can move from victimization to victory. And, you can, and it's a journey. I'm not saying it can happen overnight, but you can move there. You can go there. You can decide to go there, beloved.